Hi, my name is Katie Donovan and I'm a partner in the banking and finance team at Clayton Newts. I'm joined today by uh, a special counsel in the tax team, Louisa Wu. Hi, Louisa. Hi there. Today is the first in a series of sessions in which we'll be discussing uh, syndicated facility agreements and Section 128F of the Income Tax Assessment Act. Now, a trend that we've been seeing in the market for some years now is the use of a syndicated facility agreement in order to take advantage of the exemption under Section 128F. And that, obviously, Louisa, has some economic consequences for both the lender and the borrower under the agreement. Yes, thanks, Kate. That's right. So, generally speaking, where you have an Australian resident borrower paying interest to a non-resident lender, a liability to Australian interest withholding tax at the rate of 10% will generally arise unless an exemption such as the public offer test exemption is available. Now, a big advantage of the public offer test exemption is that not only will initial lenders under the facility benefit, but a subsequent lender who comes in as the result of a sell down in a future commitment, that lender can also benefit from the exemption. So the public offer test exemption provides lenders with much greater flexibility in terms of who they can sell down to um, in the future. Yeah, and that flexibility is obviously really important um, to lenders. One of the things that we grapple with is the, the cornerstone investor. In, in other words, a bank who has come into the structure or wants to come into the structure and hold a significant portion of the debt, say 80% of, of the debt, or alternatively, a bank who wants to hold 100% of the commitment under a specific facility in the facilities agreement. Um, does that cause an issue from a tax perspective? That's a very good question. So the cornerstone investor does raise an interesting practical question in terms of how to satisfy the requirements of the exemption. So in relation to the public offer test that applies to SFAs, the legislation says that an invitation needs to be made to become a lender under the facility. The legislation doesn't say that the invitation is made to become a lender in respect of each syndicated loan that is issued under that facility. Contrast that test with the public offer test applying to debentures, where the public offer needs to be made in respect of each debenture on a debenture by debenture basis. So on the one hand, you might say that um, the test for SFAs um, is different and it shouldn't matter whether a cornerstone investor takes up a significant um, amount of the commitment. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, why should there be a difference between debentures and SFAs from a policy perspective? Yeah, good, good point. So let's assume that we've made the public offer t um, offers and um, we now have our lenders locked in. Uh, let's assume we've got one lender or maybe two lenders. Do either of those cause issues from a withholding tax perspective? There is a requirement um, in relation to SFAs that um, ultimately by the time that interest is paid, there needs to be at least two lenders in order for the exemption to be available. So you might have only one lender initially, uh, but by the time that the interest is paid, you need to have at least two. So um, unfortunately, one lender uh, will not suffice. Now, in the other scenario that you've raised, where uh, you do have at least two lenders, um, and say one of them is a cornerstone investor who takes mm -hmm. up, you know, say 70 or 80 percent of the commitment, um, ultimately, whether that is acceptable from a public offer test exemption perspective, uh, really depends on the genuineness or bona fide of the offers when they were made. Um, so, for instance, you know. Is it the case that you have the borrower and the underwriter agreeing in writing at the outset that um, the um, underwriter will definitely um, have 80% um, or is it more a matter of the underwriter expressing their general interest that they, they would like to take up at least 80% uh, but ultimately um, the borrower reserves the right to decide the final allocations uh, once all the invitations have been made. So in relation to the first scenario, we think that's problematic. Um, second scenario, not so much. Ultimately, it depends on uh, a consideration of all the facts and circumstances surrounding the making of the invitations. 
um, and um, those um, circumstances and facts need to be tested against the requirements set, um, which are set out in the legislation. Thanks, Louisa. So if you are considering a debt capital raising, please feel free to give us a call. I think our next session will focus on syndicated facility agreements and the accordion feature within them. Thanks. See you in the next episode.